Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Majors and Quinn. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Charles Baxter uh, will read from his work. Uh, Griffin, his collection, collected short stories, has just been reissued in, or issued excuse me, in paperback. Uh, so he'll be reading from that and from some of his other favorites. Um, I also want to tell you about an event we have coming up on Monday. Um, you might have heard of this book. It's been getting a lot of press. It's Behind the Beautiful Forevers by Catherine Boo. Uh, this is a really great book, and I really encourage you to come out and hear her talk. Um, Catherine Boo is a reporter. Uh, she won a Pulitzer Prize at the Washington Post for her work on um, poverty issues. Uh, a couple years ago, she married a man from India, and in the course of going back and forth to there, she came, into, um, came to know about a slum in, uh, near Bombay called Anawadi. And this book is the result of three years of her uh, work there, her investigations and talking to people. It's an excellent, excellent uh, piece of narrative nonfiction. Um, it's really heartbreaking in many ways. Uh, it's the story not only of the people and how they live there, um, but of one particular man uh, who's accused of uh, arson, and thus his brush with criminal justice and the corruption uh, that people there face. Uh, it's a really interesting book. I, I know it sounds like a bit of a downer, and a lot of it is. <laughs> But you'll be glad that it, that it broke your heart. It's a really good book. She'll be here on Monday, uh, Catherine Boo, Behind the Beautiful Forevers. And uh, I hope if you can't make it, then you'll, you'll still pick up the book, because it's, it's really good. Um, you can find all of our events on majorsandquinn.com. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. That's all out there. We hope you'll come into the store, though, because this is where all the best stuff happens. And we'd love to see you back anytime. All of our events are free and open to the public, and we'd love to see you. So, without any further ado, Charles Baxter. Thank you. Thank you to Matrix and Quinn, and thank you all for coming. It's nice to be among friends. Or maybe I'm making an assumption I shouldn't, but <laughs> it's nice to see you all, and I do appreciate your coming up. Um, this evening is um, ostensibly the occasion of my reading from the new paperback edition of Griffin. But it's also the occasion of the reissue by uh, Random House of my novel, First Light. And uh, last week, I was talking to one of uh, my students in the MFA program, who's here tonight, Andrea Upmore, who has written a scene about a, a, a solar eclipse, which made me think, oh, I, I did that once. Uh, in, in First Light, there's a scene uh, of a solar eclipse as it happens to a little boy who is about six years old in this scene. Uh, and it's partly based on fact. Uh, as some of you in the audience may remember, there was a total solar eclipse in the Twin Cities area in 19, I checked it on Google today, 1954. 1954. I thought it was 1953, but it wasn't, it was 1954. And I'm going to read this scene to you uh, about this boy being awakened and brought out of bed to see this solar eclipse. But for those of you in the audience who uh, are not of a certain age, I have to explain that in those days, and this is now 50 years ago, when there was a solar eclipse, what you were advised to do was either to smoke glass, as it was called. You take a piece of glass and hold it over a candle until this, whatever it was, the soot had formed on the glass, and then you would hold it up to the sun, and you would be able to see the, the solar eclipse. Or what 
I did, what we did, my brother is here, what Trish did, was to take the old photographic negatives out of the Peco photo uh, envelope. Now, this is from those old days when the, the negatives were like this. And you would just layer them up and then hold them up to the sun. And that was supposed to protect you, although it didn't, from the damaging rays of the sun. And that whole idea of holding up uh, photographic negatives to see the eclipse of the sun is what is behind this scene. I'm going to add one sentence to it, and I will say there's one, those of you who are my students, <laughs> there's one huge point of view error <laughs> in it, but you'll have to spot it for yourself. Uh, can you all hear me, by the way? The boy's name is Hugh, by the way. H-U-G-H. Hugh. Hugh. Rise and shine. His father bends over him and rubs his shoulders gently. He can hardly open his eyes. Huh? It's 5.30, his father says. If you don't get up, you'll miss it. In the morning dark, Hugh finds his clothes in a mast heap piled on the floor near his tattered stuffed gorilla. It feels as if he's put his underwear on backwards and his undershirt inside out, but he doesn't care. Across the hall, he can hear his, sing his sister singing as she gets dressed. He had been dreaming of summer, baseball and dogs, or dogs playing baseball. He can't remember now. The light of sunrise stands in two parallel orange lines on each side of his window shade. He clumps out into the hallway, puts his hand up on the sticky banister, and walks downstairs where the lights are all burning. He looks into the dining room where the table is set with mats and silverware and glasses of orange juice, but where no one is sitting. And then he looks into the kitchen where he smells coffee from a freshly brewed pot standing on a hand-painted porcelain trivet on the side counter. Someone has brought the bacon out. There's an open package near the stove and five eggs lined up next to it and a large black frying pan on a burner, but no one is here to cook it. For a series of separated moments, Hugh can't remember why he is here why his father shook his shoulders to wake him, why his sister has come downstairs at a run and washed up and what rushed out the back hallway to the yard. Then he remembers. They're all up this early summer morning because of what's going to happen to the sun. His mother, father, and sister are standing on the sloping green back lawn facing east where the sun has now risen. Good morning, Chief, his father says, handing him a pack of several black and white photographic negatives. Look through these, kiddo. There may be more than you need, but just take a few away until you can see it. His father holds on to a piece of smoked glass in his right hand. His mother has a square of glass also, but his sister has another set of negatives. It should start in about five minutes, his father says looking at his watch. Hugh takes one of the negatives out of the pack and holds it up to the blue of the sky, and there he is, Hugh himself as a baby, held in his mother's arms underneath a whitened tree. On negatives, all trees appear as if they're covered with ghost snow, and his own face as a baby is gray, with white eyes. On a second negative, his grandmother, Welsh, his father's mother, whom Hugh remembers through his sense of taste, 
He can remember his grandmother giving him a powdered sugar donut from a white bag in church. She stands on a sidewalk waving, waving goodbye. On a third negative, his grandfather, whom he never knew, wears farmer overalls and sits on a tractor. He has never been able to believe it. His grandfather was a farmer. He worked with his hands. He was successful, so he could send his son to college to get him off the farm. And here on another negative, he and his sister are holding hands. His sister was just two years old. In the negative, his sister's white dress looks like a Halloween costume. Another negative, the next door neighbor's dog, Ruby, before she was hit by a reckless man, Mr. Lesh, driving his DeSoto. In the negative, Rudy's, Ruby's mouth is open and her tongue hangs out in her friendly way. And here's a negative of his mother's mother, Mrs. Hooker, the big granny whom you never knew, also a farmer's wife sitting on a front porch rocking chair holding a glass of something, maybe lemonade. She's laughing, her white hair black, her dark mouth white. And finally, a picture of his mother outside facing the camera and the sun, smiling, her hand raised to shield her eyes. Hugh looks over at his mother and sees that she is shielding her eyes just now, just as she was doing in the picture. Look, she says, and turns quickly to Hugh. Hold them all up, Huey. You can see now it's starting. Hugh puts his collection of negatives together holds it up into the air, directly in front of the sun, and he looks through it. He sees the big, round image of the sun, darkened by the seven negatives through which its light has traveled, with a small bite of the sun missing on one side. This, he has been told, is the moon, which is about to block out the sun completely, but temporarily. Very interesting, sort of. But Hugh is not yet convinced it was worth getting up this time of the morning. <laughs> he puts the negatives down and squints at Five Oaks Lake and the amusement park to the south, mostly obscured by the trees in Five Oaks Park. Hmm, his mother says, but otherwise it's very quiet. So quiet, in fact, that he can hear an early morning fisherman gunning his motor out there somewhere in the lake. He looks harder at the lake and sees a dot crossing it, a dot dragging a funnel of waves. He holds his packet of negatives up to the sun again. More of the sun has been circled out by the moon. Hugh removes one negative from the pack, the one of his mother, and the disappearing sun shines through the other six, and instead of looking at the sun, Hugh sees the dog, Ruby, superimposed on his big granny and he himself as a baby over the two of them, and his grandfather on his tractor superimposed on top of himself, holding hands with his sister, all of the separate images piled on top of one another, one large distinct collection of the past, and in the middle of it the darkening sun, now shaped like a burning three-quarter moon, shining through them. <coughs> holding the negatives, he lowers his arm and looks at his parents. They're standing on the lawn, holding the squares of smoke glass out in front of their eyes. His father is wearing an old white shirt, soft hat, and stained pressed trousers. In his left hand is a cigarette, burned down to with a half, within a half inch of his father's fingers. Behind him, Hugh's mother also holds the glass in front of her eyes. The early morning breeze blows against the front of her dress so that it seems almost to billow out behind her on either side of her legs. The morning breeze rustles the leaves on the old elm near them, its branches held together with support cables. Near his mother, his sister gazes through all her negatives at the sun, her face almost glazed with happiness. Are you bored, Hugh? His father asks him. Look under the trees. Look behind the vines. He does as he is told. He walks over to the elm's huge trunk and looks down at the shadows its leaves are casting, half moon shadows 
hundreds of them. He runs back to the house where the vines are clinging to the exterior wall behind, beside the kitchen window, and he checks the shadows, more half-moons, bits of half-moon light jumping on the house. He returns to where his parents are standing and holds up the negatives again, but instead of watching the sun's eclipse, he gazes again at the collection of negatives, his grandmother, his grandfather, his neighbor's dog, himself, his sister, and his mother, all crowdedly occupying the same space, and each one distinct, the sun blotted out behind all of them. At the moment when his father says, now it's almost total, Hugh looks at the world of his family's backyard, the trees, his house, his mother, his father, and his sister standing in the gray stillness of the false night, no one and nothing moving, the sun blanked and shadowed. Yes, his father says before he drops his cigarette butt onto the gray green of the lawn. Then Hugh notices that the birds have stopped singing. And in the bad quiet of this moment, when his parents seem unable to move, and the light on the lawn makes him think of the sun sick and dying, he walks backwards away from them and he sits on the dew-covered grass, and no one notices him there, notices him there for several minutes until the sun starts to come back, and his mother turns around and says, Hugh, darling, what are you doing there? Why aren't you watching? Why are you crying? The reason I decided to, to, to uh, read that is that I'm teaching a course over at the university right now, um, and the, 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 the subject of it is more or less fiction in which there are moments uh, in which time stands still. And I thought, well, I've done that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I thought that as a contrast to that, I would read a few pages from the opening of a story called Kiss Away. Um, why? Because the story takes place, uh, or the, a, a major part of it takes place in a greasy spoon on Hennepin. <laughs> Uh, and uh, right around here, I think, actually. Uh, at, when I was writing the story, I thought, oh, the greasy spoon is somewhere around uh, Birch Pharmacy. But there aren't any greasy spoons around there unless you count wives. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I'll read. I'll just read a few minutes from this, uh, and then uh, we can have a Q&A. The, the story begins with, uh, I feel as if I'm, I'm revealing all of these arcane bits of information. Uh, the story begins with a reference to upstairs sleeping porches. Uh, and there are a lot of those in Kenwood. Uh, except they aren't sleeping porches anymore. They're usually storage rooms if they still exist. And of course, these were just upstairs places that were screened in where people went to sleep uh, on hot nights during the summer. Kiss away. The house had an upstairs sleeping porch. And she first saw the young man from up there limping through the alley and carrying a torn orange and yellow Chinese kite. He had a dog with him. And both the dog and the man had a look of scruffy unseriousness. From the look of it, no project these two got involved with could last longer than 10 minutes. That was the first thing she liked about it. Mid-morning, mid-week, mid-summer. Even teenagers were working, 
and in this flat July heat, no one with any sense was trying to fly kites. No one but a fool would try to fly a kite in this weather. The young man threw the ball of string and the ripped cloth into the alley's trash bin while the dog watched him. Then the dog sat down and with an expression of pained concentration scratched violently behind its ear. It looked around for something else to be interested in, barked at a cat on a window ledge, then gave up the effort and scratched its ear again. From the upstairs sleeping porch, the young man looked exactly like the fool in the tarot pack, shaggy and loose-limbed, a songster at the edge of cliffs. And the dog was the image of the fool's dog, a frisky yellow mutt. Dogs tended to like fools. They had an affinity. Fools always gave dogs plenty to do. <laughs> Considering this, the woman near the window felt her heart pound twice. Her heart was precise. It was like a doorbell. She was unemployed. She had been out of college for a year, hadn't been able to find a job she could tolerate more than a few days. And with the last of her savings had rented the second floor of this house in Minneapolis, which included this old-fashioned sleeping porch facing east. She slept out here, and then in the morning she sat in a hardback chair reading books from the library, drinking coffee, and listening to classical music on the public radio station. Right now, they were playing the Goyescas of Enrique Granados. She was running out of money and trying to stay calm about it, and the music helped her. The music seemed to say that she could sit like this all morning and nobody would punish her. It was very Spanish. <laughs> she put on her shoes and threw keys into the pocket of her jeans. She raised the slat of blinds. Hey, she yelled down into the alley. Hey, yourself, the young man yelled back. He smiled at her and squinted. Apparently, he couldn't see her clearly. That was the second thing she liked about him. You can't throw that kite in there, she said. That dumpster is only for people who live right in this building. <laughs> she shaded her eyes against the sun to see him better. The guy's dog was now standing and wagging its tail. OK, he said, I'll take it out. And when she told him not to, and that she'd be down in a second, and he should just wait there, she knew he would do what she asked. What she hadn't expected was that he would smile enormously at her and, when she appeared, give her a hug. <laughs> they were strangers, after all. A hug right out of the blue. She pushed him away but could not manage to be angry at him. Then she felt the dog's tongue slurping on her fingers as if she'd spilled sauce on them and they needed some cleaning. He offered to buy her coffee, and he explained himself as they walked. He had once had good prospects, he said, and a future about which he could boast. He had been accepted into medical school 18 months ago, but had come down with a combination of mononucleosis and bacterial pneumonia, and after recuperating, he had lost all of his interest in great plans. The two illnesses, one virus and one bacteria, had taken the starch out of him, he said. He actually used expressions like that. He had a handsome face when you saw him up close, but as soon as you walked a few feet away from him, something went wrong with his appearance. It <coughs> degenerated sometimes. <laughs> His name was Walton Tyner Ross, but he liked to be called Glaze because of his taste for donuts <laughs> and his habitual faraway expression. She didn't think someone whose nickname was Glaze was ever going to become a successful practitioner of medicine, 
But in a certain light in the morning, he was the finest thing she had seen in some time, especially when viewed from a few inches away as they walked down Hennepin Avenue to breakfast. And I'm going to finish by um, the second time that they go to this greasy spoon and she has, she's with Glaze, but she has an encounter. In the restaurant at the counter spotted with dried jam and brown gravy, where the waitress said, Hiya, Glaze, and poured him his coffee without being asked, Jody felt a pleasant shiver of jealousy. So many people seemed to know this unremarkable but handsome guy. He or something about him was infectious. The thought occurred to her that he might change her life. By the time her Belgian waffle arrived, Jody had circled six wand ads for temp secretaries with extensive computer experience. She knew and understood computers backwards and forwards and hated them all, but they were like family members and she could work with them if she had to. She didn't really want the jobs. She wanted to sit on the sleeping porch with her feet up on the windowsill and listen to the piano music of Granados and watch things go by in the alley. But the atmosphere of early morning ambition in the cafe was beginning to move her to action. She had even brought along a pen. <laughs> she felt a nudge in her ribs. She turned to her left and saw sitting next to her the same fat, balding man with horrible yellow-green eyes whom she had seen the day before. His breath smelled of gin and graham crackers. <laughs> He was smiling at her unpleasantly. It was quite a package. <coughs> Excuse me, miss, he said. Hate to bother you. I'm short bus fare. You got 75 cents? His speech wore the clothes of an obscure, untraceable Eastern European accent. Sure, she said without thinking. She fished out three quarters from her pocket and gave the money to him. Here, she said. She turned back to the wand ads. Oh boy, he said, scooping it up. Are you ever lucky? <laughs> Am I, she asked. You got that right, he said. He rose unsteadily and his yellow-green eyes leered at her. And for a moment, Jody thought that he might topple over like a collapsed circus tent covering her underneath his untucked shirt and soiled, beltless trousers. I, he announced to the restaurant, although nobody was paying any attention to him, I am the genie of the magic lamp. Nobody even looked up. The fat man bent down toward her. Come back tomorrow, he said in a ghoulish whisper. Now he smelled of fireplace ash. You get your prize. <laughs> After a moment, he staggered out of the restaurant in a series of forward and sideways lurching motions, almost knocking over on the way a stainless steel coat rack. The waitress behind the counter watched him leave with an expression on her face of irritated indifference made more explicit by her hand on her hip and a pink bubble almost the color of blood exploding out of, expanding from her lips. Bubble gum was extraordinarily effective at expressing contempt, Jody thought. All the great waitresses chew gum. <laughs> Who was that? She asked Walton. Well, shook his head like a spring-loaded toy on the back shelf of a car. As usual, he smiled before answering. Don't know, he said. Some guy, Tad or Tad used, he always asks people for money. Usually they ignore him. Nobody's given him any money in a long time. Come on, we're going to my place to make phone calls. Then we'll go on a treasure hunt. Uh, and... Uh, the next time, I'll just finish it, the next time she sees him, the fat guy in the restaurant, 
he sits down next to, him, to her and says, well, if I was you, I'd ignore him, meaning Glaze. They don't call him Glaze for nothing. So, what's your three wishes? I'm the genie of the magic lamp, like I said. You do me a favor, I do you a favor. Jody noticed that the fat man's voice was hollow as if it had emerged out of an echo chamber. She also had the momentary perception that the man's limbs were attached to the rest of his body with safety pins. I don't have three wishes, she said. Everybody's got three wishes, the fat man said. Don't bullshit the genie. There's <laughs> nobody on earth doesn't have three wishes. The three wishes, he said, are universal. Listen, Tad, Walton said. He was beginning. Jody noticed a slow, threatening male dance like sway back and forth like the prelude to a fight. Leave the lady alone. All I'm asking her for is three wishes, the fat man said. That's not much. He ran his dirty fingers through his thinning hair. You can whisper them if you want to, he said. There's some people who prefer that. All right, all right, Jody said. She leaned toward him and lowered her voice toward the genie of the magic lamp so that only he could hear her. She just wanted to be left alone with Walton. She wanted to finish her coffee. Her needs were small. I want a job, she said softly. And I like that guy sitting next to me to love me, and I'd like a better radio when I listen to music in the morning. That's it? The fat man stood up, a look of storybook outrage on his face. I give you three wishes and you kiss them away like that? What's the matter with you? <laughs> give an American three wishes and what do they do? They kiss them away. That's the trouble with this country. No imagination when it comes to wishes. All right, my pretty, he said. You got it. And he dropped his dirty handkerchief in her lap. <laughs> When she picked it up to remove it, she felt something travel up her arm. The electricity of disgust. <laughs> the fat man rose and waddled out of the restaurant. She let go of the handkerchief and it drifted toward the floor. And what was that? Jody asked. What just happened? She was shaken. That, Walton told her, was a typical incident at Claire's Country Kitchen Cafe. You're shaking. <laughs> What'd you ask for? She turned to look out the front window and saw Walton's dog gazing straight back at her in an eerie manner. I asked for a job and a better radio and a million dollars. Then what was all that stuff about Kiss Away? I don't know, Walton. Can we go, please? Can we pay our bill and leave? Oh, I just remembered Walton's. It's that Rolling Stones song. It's one of those antique albums, you know, on LPs. He raised his head to sing. Love, sister, it's just a kiss away, kiss away, kiss away. I don't think that's what she meant, or what he, what he meant, Joey said. Who knows? Walton said. Maybe it was. Anyway, just think of him as an overweight placebo person. He doesn't <laughs> grant you the wish because, after all, he's just a fat psycho, but he could put you in the right frame of mind. We've got to think positively here. <laughs> I like how you defended me, Jody said, getting all male and everything. <laughs> no problem, Walton said, holding up his fist for inspection. I like fights. <laughs> point of view error? <laughs> I shouldn't. This is, this is not a quiz. <laughs> it's the hand-painted porcelain trivet. How, there's no way that a seven-year-old would ever notice or even know about a hand-painted porcelain trivet. I, I guess my John Updike side just got the best of <laughs> So are, are there any questions? Um, Comments, editorials. <laughs> oh, uh, there's there's a moment. Somebody uh, somebody here is responsible for one of the sentences. Um, 
when uh, uh, Jody and Walton are in, are in the uh, in the diner, and the waitress uh, is is chewing gum. The sentence comes up: "All the great waitresses chewed gum." And oh. It's Trisha's line. <laughs> it's Patricia Hample's line. It's probably the best line I read this evening. Uh, and for it, I didn't say always. I'll have to look it up. It's all the great. All the great. All the great waitresses. It's a poem. It's in a poem. It's in a so poem. It's, a it's in a poem. Right, so I don't remember. It's my poem, but I don't remember. Yeah. It. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's 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 Patricia's poem about James White. Uh, and it's something he says to you, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a beautiful poem. So, uh, inquiries? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, you pointed out the point of view error. When you, when you collected the works and go back and look at them, do you find a lot of those things? And do they bother you at all? Or do you talk well, to not really. I mean, when I was reading that chapter from first life, what I was thinking was, I don't write like this anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't write like this anymore. This is the way I wrote 26 or 27 years ago. Mm -hmm. This particular style is what I was doing now. And it's, it's, it's very warm. Uh, uh, and it's, it's much less interested in moving scenes forward. Than, than the kind of thing that I do now. Uh, and there's a kind of haze over it. Um, and th th there's just a kind of lyric sense to it, which, um, but that's, not, that's not what you're asking. I, you know, when I don't read my old stuff, and the only reason I, I, I read the stories that were in this book was that I, I needed to see if there was something radically wrong with, with any of them uh, that, that I needed to fix. And there were only, uh, what can I say, there were only a few things that were radically wrong <laughs> that, that, that I had to fix. I mean, the, the, the uh, major changes were simply those in which I had gotten something wrong that the copy editor should have caught, uh, and that was that was mostly what I what I ended up correcting. Yes, Wahida. <laughs> so first light moves backwards in time. It does. As it goes forward, um, could you talk about how that affected your approach to plot as you were writing? Yeah, um, Wahida's question was um, since. First light moves backwards in time. How did that affect the way in which the plot was organized? And, and the, the short answer to that question is, in a way, there's almost no plot in it. It's a chronicle rather than a plot. But there, there, there is something that the alert reader should be tracking in it, which is that Dorsey's older brother, Hugh, who is the point of view figure in the solar eclipse scene, seems to have been wounded by something which results in his compulsion, apparently, or effort to take care of his little sister long after she has, uh, she has no need for that. And in, in a way, what you're going back to is the moment at which, in a sense, Hugh has been <coughs> traumatized is maybe too strong a word. But I think you're kind of waiting for that moment to, to occur. And finally, it does. And, you, and I was hoping the reader would get to that moment and think, oh, now I get it. No, I get, it's just as if everything in the, in the novel begins to fall into place, which is very different in a way from the unfolding of a plot where you think, what happens next? In, in First Light, you already know what happens next. And, and so the sense of it much more is, why did it happen in this way? 
what happened to these people so that they should end up like this. Um, and I mean, there's been a lot of that kind of storytelling of, of novels that moved back in time, but when I wrote it, I didn't really have any models except Harold Pinter's play, Betrayal. Um, and so I, and I um, thought, maybe this can't be done, but I, it seemed worth trying. It seemed worth trying. It was originally going to be called Broken Symmetries, and the publisher wouldn't let, it, let me call, call it that. So I had to call it First Light. My second novel was going to be called Leavings, and they said you can't call it that. <laughs> oh, um, I, oh, I remember it as if it were yesterday. I remember my, my uh, editor on the phone said, can't you imagine the reviews? Charles Baxter's Leavings? <laughs> she said, <laughs> She said, it makes me think of what mice leave behind in the kitchen at night. And I said, okay, okay. But it was really the best title for that. For that it was, I still miss it. You know, if anybody ever shows it to me, I'll scratch out the title and write it in the evenings instead. What was this one with Broken Centuries? They thought it was too abstract. It's, it's a term in physics, broken symmetry, that some physicists use to describe uh, what they theorize as being at the beginning of the universe. There's a moment of broken symmetry, and suddenly you have matter. Uh, but because I had, I was telling the story of a brother and a sister, and because they're so in some ways attuned to each other. They can sometimes, in the way that siblings sometimes can, they can almost read each other's thoughts even when they're not there. I thought it was, you know, a pretty good title, but um, publishers really think a lot about the title and they often will say, oh, you can't call it that. <laughs> uh, yes, Sally? Um. Do you mind if I repeat some of the things I was talking about last year? Go on. Mm. Um, Sally asked, um, uh, Sally Franzen asked how I conceptualize the construction of the novel. And um, what I used to do was uh, abide by Richard Bausch's uh, it's not a formula exactly. It's just something that he used to think. Of. He used to tell his students, "I think up, I think up characters whom I love, and then I visit trouble upon." Them. <laughs> Which means that you have to think. First of all, for me, you have to think of a character, and then you have to think of what that character could be tempted by. Uh, what is that character's Achilles' heel? What is the thing that will make him or her? do something that will provoke him or the situation into some kind of interesting trouble. Uh, trouble that is going to reveal who that person is and what kind of situation he or she finds uh, themselves in. Uh, and particularly when I was working on First Light, I was trying to figure out what kind of difficulty those, or, or, not, I'm sorry, not First Light, but Feast of Love, what kind of trouble those characters were going to get into, and how I could keep that novel from just becoming a bunch of, of episodes. And, and um, I, was, I was really in despair about that novel until I realized that a character in it named uh, Oscar was going to die. The day I realized he was going to die was one of the happiest days of my life. <laughs> because I could see that his death was going to cause all of these people to draw together into a kind of community, which is exactly what that novel needed. Uh, 
in Sally's class last year, one of the things that I was talking about to my students was that in plot-directed uh, fiction, you often have to have, this is what I you know, sort of later thought and what I was thinking of when, when I wrote the last couple of novels. You need a Captain Happen character. You need somebody who will say the things that other characters won't say. Or, or who will do things that other people won't do. Someone who's volatile and impulsive and kind of dangerous to be around. You really need people like that in, in novels. And, and, and you need to have a situation in which time is going to run out on everybody. They do not have all the time in the world. Time is going to run out on them. Uh, and it helps to have what I ended up calling one-way gates, that is they do something that causes the situation to change so they can't get back to where they were before they did it. Um, and, well, I mean, those are the main things. Those are the main things. Um, and it's, it's amazing how useful that those kinds of just rules of thumb can be if you're trying to construct a story that's going to move forward. Um, oh, the other thing that I felt I discovered when I was at, at, when I went to see Macbeth at, at the Guthrie was it helps to have a request moment in the story. It helps to have a moment in which one character said, turns to another and says, there's something I want you to do. And I want you to do it in about two weeks. Uh, you know, Macbeth starts that way, King Lear starts that way, Hamlet starts that way. Uh, you know, it's a hell of a way to get a story started. Just to have one character turn to another and say, there's something I want you to do. Uh, and even if the character refuses to do it, it's still a story. Hamlet sort of refuses to do it. It's, it's still a good play. <laughs> <laughs> So those are, those are some of the things think about. Um, it? Since I feel I know everybody. <laughs> <laughs> How do you, you obviously are, are also a, a, a critic, you know, for the, for the New York Review books, and you know, you've written essays on the Believer and stuff like that, on sort of the 